Welcome to this video, which will discuss the management of gastrointestinal symptoms in pediatric palliative care. Our learning objectives for this video is with respect to pediatric patients with life-limiting illnesses, after watching this video, you should be able to assess and manage nausea and vomiting, as well as dry mouth and serosomia. Let's start by looking at nausea and vomiting. Nausea and vomiting are very common in pa pediatric palliative care, and we need to have a good understanding of how to approach this symptom, as it can have a number of different causes, and our treatments will be targeted to the underlying cause. This diagram illustrates some of the pathways which are involved in causing nausea and vomiting. If we look at the chemoreceptor trigger zone, we can see the neurotransmitters that are involved are dopamine and serotonin. There are a number of different causes for this pathway, or for the chemoreceptor trigger zone to be involved, including medications such as chemotherapy, opioids, and SSRIs, toxins, including those produced when the body is under infection or other cytokines, and biochemical abnormalities such as hypercalcemia or uremia. The antiemetics that we might consider for this zone include metoclopramide and domperidone, since they target do do dopamine receptors, as well as haloperidol for the same reason. Ondansetron, granisetron, and other 5-HT3 antagonists are also appropriate. Other areas which cause vomiting include the gastrointestinal tract, the brain cortex, the vomiting center, and the vestibular apparatus. I want to highlight the vomiting center since a number of neurotransmitters are active here, including acetylcholine, dopamine, and histamine. This is the final common pathway for vomiting and coordinates the vomiting reflex. Antiemetics, which can be considered for this center include those that are the same as at the chemoreceptor trigger zone with the possible addition of antihistamines. If we look at this slide, we can look at some of the more common pathophysiological causes for vomiting and where they trigger. At the level of the cerebral cortex, we know that vomiting can be induced by anxiety and situations. Particularly, we see with children undergoing cancer treatment, they may develop anticipatory nausea or a nausea associated with coming to hospital. This occurs before they even receive chemotherapy at the hospital. Elevated intracranial pressure also plays a role at this level. We discussed already those factors involved at the chemoreceptor trigger zone. At the vestibular apparatus, we know that motion, tumors in the area, and sometimes opioids trigger this mechanism. And within the gastrointestinal tract, radiation and chemotherapy are common triggers for nausea and other gastrointestinal abnormalities such as inflammation, obstruction, gastroparesis, compression, toxins, and medications can induce nausea. When we consider the management of nausea, it's important to take a detailed history to first identify potential causes or contributing factors for the nausea. We should ask the child and their parents about the timing, quality, and severity of the nausea. Oral intake, hydration status, and hunger are also important to consider. We should ask about abdominal pain and symptoms of reflux, as well as the presence of headaches or other neurological symptoms, which could indicate increased intracranial pressure. We should seek information about whether the child is constipated since this can lead to nausea. Emotional factors should also be explored, including any symptoms of anxiety and depression, which could be contributing to nausea. And a complete medication list should be reviewed to identify any potential causes. On physical examination, we can focus on the abdomen and oral pharynx, as well as a screening neurological examination to identify any potential increased intracranial pressure or other neurological signs. The Keller Index of Nausea describes a pattern of behaviors and symptoms which could indicate nausea in nonverbal children. As you can see from this list, it is quite extensive and it may not be specific for nausea, but it may assist you in assessing children who aren't able to communicate verbally. When we think about investigations to assess and treat nausea, we should consider these in the context of whether they match the child and family's goals for care. If a child is very close to the end of their life, we may not do all of these investigations. Common electrolyte abnormalities which trigger nausea should be looked for including abnormalities in calcium, magnesium, sodium, and phosphate, 
a complete blood count and albumin should also be considered. Radiological investigations of the abdomen can be particularly helpful. And in certain cases, if you have cause for suspicion, you can image the brain as well, looking for tumors or other um, abnormalities to suggest a central cause. The treatment of nausea begins with looking at environmental changes. Allow the child to eat smaller me meals. Let them choose their favorite foods and drinks to eat. Make the environment calm and comfortable for eating and especially minimize any strong smells. Ensure that good mouth care is done so the child's mouth is clean and free of infection. Ice and other cold foods are also quite helpful and children find these less nauseating in general. Integrative strategies should also be used in the treatment of nausea in all cases. This may include support for anxiety and other emotions through counseling, relaxation techniques, or guided imagery. Aromatherapy using lemon, peppermint, ginger, or orange essential oils can be quite helpful for children. And you can try these with children to see how much they like these smells. Acupressure and acupuncture is quite effective in adults and older children may benefit from this approach as well. In terms of the medication used to treat nausea, we should treat based on the underlying cause if we can identify it. For our first line nausea medication, we should use it scheduled, not SOS. This should be combined with a second medication of a different class, which is an SOS medication. If this strategy is ineffective, then the second medication should be given regularly as well. And a third medication of a different class should be started on an SOS basis. If we look at the medications, we again think about which receptors they target, and this should be driven by what we think is the underlying cause for the nausea. Serotonin receptor antagonists that work on 5-HT3 receptors include granisetron, ondansetron, and there are another of other ones in this category as well. Antihistaminergic agents. There are a lot of different medications in this class, and all are considered equally effective and dopaminergic agents, such as metoclopramide and haloperidol can also be considered if the chemoreceptor trigger zone is involved. These also work at the vomiting center, so can be quite effective when the cause is not known. I note that you should always be aware of the risk of extrapyramidal effects and consider prophylactic diphenhydramine to reduce this risk, particularly with metoclopramide. Here are another of other number of other causes, classes of medications which can be involved in the treatment of nausea. Prokinetic agents, which work on the GI tract, such as metoclopramide and domperidone, can be quite useful. Muscarinic receptor antagonists, including scopolamine or hyoscine hydrobromide. Cannabinoids, such as nabilone, which is available in some countries and has good evidence to treat nausea induced by chemotherapy. Steroids, if you feel that the patient's nausea and vomiting is related to increased intracranial pressure. Benzodiazepines, if the nausea and vomiting is related to anxiety or anticipatory nausea. And neurokinin receptor antagonists, such as iprepitant, can also be considered for chemoreceptor trigger zone induced nausea and vomiting. This is a helpful table which shows some of the commonly used antiemetics and the receptors that they block. As you can see, some antiemetics have action on more than one type of receptor, particularly levomopromacine or methotrimepresine is a broad spectrum antiemetic. So it can be useful to provide treatment for nausea even when the exact cause is unclear. Let's do a couple quiz questions together. You are caring for a 10 year old who is receiving palliative chemotherapy for advanced osteosarcoma. He develops vomiting soon after receiving chemotherapy. You want to target the chemoreceptor trigger zone. Which of the medi following medications is the best choice for this target? Take a moment to consider your options. Diphenhydronate, scopolamine, ondansetron, lorazepam, or dexamethasone. The correct answer in this case is ondansetron as it targets 5-HT3 receptors, which are active at the chemoreceptor trigger zone. Here's a second question to consider. A three-year-old girl with a progressive neurodegenerative condition is receiving palliative care. She has been started on opioid treatment and develops nausea within a day of starting the treatment. The most appropriate management is diphenhydronate, scopolamine, 
on Dancitron or Haloperidol. In this case, you could consider Haloperidol since it is an antidopaminergic agent and, on dance, and opioid induced nausea is typically mediated by dopamine. Now let's look at dry mouth or serosomia briefly. There are a number of common causes for dry mouth, including medications such as anticholinergics, opioids, and diuretics mouth breathing, the use of medical air or oxygen, dehydration, local infection, disease and treatment related factors such as graft versus host disease, surgery and radiotherapy to the mouth. In terms of the non-pharmacological management, we suggest regular oral hygiene to prevent infection or mucositis with teeth brushing and washing out the mouth with clean water. Frequent sips of fluid can also help as can crushed ice or other frozen foods. Stimulating saliva with hard candies or sugar-free chewing gum can also be particularly effective, although it typically only lasts as long as the candies or gum is in the mouth. Other pharmacological managements include the use of artificial saliva, stopping medications that cause dry mouth if possible, providing humidification of the oxygen or air that the patient is receiving. If the patient complains of pain, we can use a topical lidocaine gel to provide some numbing in the mouth. And for mucositis, we also use chlorhexidine mouthwash. Let's wrap up today's video with this summary. We know that gastrointestinal symptoms are common in pediatric palliative care. For nausea and vomiting, we try to choose treatment strategies to address the underlying cause. For dry mouth, the general strategies include oral hygiene and using additional humidity and moisturizing to ensure the mouth is more moist.